Chapter Eleven of the Pocket Measure by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: Perfect Love Casteth Out Fear. It was with a great many little inward flutters of satisfaction that Mrs. Spafford went about her small house one Thursday, making preparations for leaving it to its own quiet for a few hours perhaps it is one of the compensations to those who live simple quiet lives that small pleasures are intensified and enjoyed with a zest that persons who live in excitement know nothing about the mere going down town of a pleasant afternoon and returning again with her husband was an event in mrs spafford's life for street car fares were guarded carefully therefore it fell to her lot to go rarely she had determined however to avail herself of mrs temple's invitation and attend the missionary meeting despite her husband's revelation as to mrs temple's social status the youthful matron felt that one of the thrills of satisfaction proceeded from the thought of meeting that lady again i can't help it if she is rich she said to herself with a happy smile as she arrayed herself for the street she is very pleasant and cordial and i'm going to like her just as much as i want to what an absurd idea that because she is rich and i am poor there should necessarily be a gulf between us besides i'm not poor i hardly know of a person who is less so i am not sure that i can explain to you what a sense of satisfaction it gave mrs spafford to be greeted among that company of christian women directly she entered the church she felt it that subtle atmosphere of congeniality she was at home she was in sympathy with the words that were being read from the bible she was in sympathy with the prayer that followed the sweet clear-voiced petitioner was her new-found friend mrs temple as she rose from her knees she rejoiced over the thought that all these grand good women were friends the truth is if you are in sympathy with the atmosphere which surrounded her you will know all about what she felt in being led into the circle of christian sisterhood if you are not no words of mine can possibly make it plain to you still life did not go smoothly even here it transpired that there was something some duty to perform which in itself mrs spafford judged must be a severe ordeal for during the singing of the hymn must jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free no there's a cross for every one and there's a cross for me mrs temple slipped softly from one to another and preferred some request which mrs spafford interested as she was in the hymn and joining in it as she did with the full strength of her cultured voice could not but see met with demur with shruggings of shoulders with distressed negatives and as the petitioner pled the refusals became more emphatic in manner until one and another and yet another lady had been interviewed with the same result what could be wanted she was soon destined to know for mrs temple raised her head with a troubled air and looking about her irresolutely as they began the third verse of the hymn spied her new acquaintance and came speedily toward her i am so glad to see you she whispered with a cordial hand clasp and i do wonder if the dear lord has not sent you to me just now as a helper dear mrs spafford i am in an embarrassing dilemma several of our ladies who are nearly always present strangely enough are absent this afternoon and i have really no one on whom to depend wouldn't you be so kind i know it is too hard to ask you at your first coming and you an entire stranger in our midst but if you would feel that you could offer prayer with us i would be so glad now i shall have to admit to you that mrs spafford was startled and embarrassed it was a new experience to her she felt the hot blood mounting in waves to her forehead and knew that the hand which mrs temple still held trembled visibly poor child said mrs temple soothingly as one who was more than twenty years her senior had a right to speak to the young matron it is too hard 
i ought not to ask you yet mrs spafford's embarrassment did not proceed from the source to which it was credited she was astonished and perplexed to discover that the cross which was pressing so heavily on this company of christian women was simply to present their desires to their loving sympathizing all-powerful lord how could they shrink from it in this way what was there that should be expected to so disturb her was it something different from prayer more than prayer that they wanted was it expected that a missionary prayer should make wise reference to the different mission stations and their work and present intelligently the special needs of each field that indeed she could not do and she recognized a chance for embarrassment in the admission of the fact that she a woman and a christian in this nineteenth century was not posted but then immediately she reflected that prayer was different from any other exercise in that the one addressed needed no information was thoroughly acquainted with the needs of all mission fields and the desires of all human hearts and yet had chosen that the heart cry should go out from his children o lord thou knowest do unto us even as thou hast said mrs spafford though lamentably conscious of her ignorance as regarded the work of foreign missions yet knew that her heart desired their greatest good and was acquainted with the one to whom to bring their case why then should it be considered so serious a thing thought is not unlike chain lightning you know and while they were singing one line of the hymn now alarmingly near its close this woman had gone over the ground at which i have hinted and come back to her starting point what is it you want mrs temple a specific prayer for some special mission and its workers mentioning them by name because if you do i am ashamed to tell you that i do not understand the work well enough to lead you oh my dear child no we do not want an address in the form of a prayer we want simply to have our hearts brought close to the heart of christ and his help asked for this meeting this day then i will be glad to pray said mrs spafford simply and she did not know that she was saying a strange thing she had lived in another world than theirs she had been brought up with a mother with whom to pray was to talk with a dear and familiar friend she had attended from her earlier girlhood a weekly prayer meeting with her mother where the ladies prayed together precisely as they talked together feeling no more embarrassment in the one instance than in the other she had begun by feeling a degree of nervous tremor it is true at the sound of her own voice before so many but there had been no great gulf placed between the thought of conversing before others and the thought of praying before them indeed callie howell when a girl of sixteen had expressed herself naively to her mother after this fashion why mother i would rather pray than say anything to the people about any particular subject because one cannot help thinking that they may criticize the way you are saying it or the thought itself but of course i remember that jesus christ never criticizes my prayer and that the people are all engaged in speaking to him at the same time and therefore are not thinking of me as a teacher it had for years been her privilege to lead young ladies prayer circles present for many a timid heart its cry for help its burden of sorrow until prayer had come to be to her what it ought to be to every human heart a privilege and a joy her embarrassment you will perceive arose simply and solely from astonishment over the thought that she was expected to consider a cross and a trial what was to her a joy a curious suggestion that perhaps she ought not to feel so ready to offer that which others so much older and wiser and in every sense better than herself visibly shrank from presented itself to haunt her if satan could command a moment of admiration from any of his tempest-tossed victims it would surely be on account of his unwearying ingenuity of course the matter was all settled in much less time than it has taken me to present its phases to you and mrs spafford received mrs temple's relieved oh thank you my dear 
and she had heard her name called as one who would lead them in prayer and she had bowed with the rest and for the first two or three sentences her heart kept up its questioning tumult and well nigh drove her from her refuge then the force of habit and the force of will asserted themselves nay rather the spirit brooded over her helped her infirmities and she was enabled to shut them all out all the questionings and embarrassments and come as a child to its father with her simple call putting him in remembrance of all the great array of promises wherewith he had pillared her faith since her reasoning powers began the prayer was very simple very indefinite so far as regarded the special mission field under consideration but even here the suppliant was true to her true self and made bold confession dear lord thou knowest that i know almost nothing about this great africa which we remember before thee to-day i confess with shame my ignorance of what has been done or is doing or of what thy ministers or handmaidens stand in special need of there save that i know they need our prayers but these thy servants who have taken up the work here at home know all about the field and all its pressing needs and obstacles and triumphs and i pray thee take from each heart before thee its special burden for this portion of thy field and give to them a song of assurance that thou wilt remember thy covenant i wonder how many of those his servants gathered in that room listening to that prayer felt their cheeks burn with the thought that they knew extremely little about africa or its missionaries and were not conscious of any special burdens for the lord to lift what was there in that prayer to move so many of those ladies to tears it was as simple as a child's and as direct perhaps therein lay the secret it had its reflex influence on mrs spafford she was mortified and grieved to realize that she knew so little about the foreign work the barest general outlines were all that she felt safe in referring to the gaboon mission with its different stations and strange sounding names were all unfamiliar the names and circumstances of the missionaries stationed there she only knew in a shadowy sort of way even dear mr bushnell to whom some of the ladies so constantly referred in their reports as though he were inseparably intertwined with every fibre of the mission was a name known to mrs spafford only by seeing brief extracts from his letters at long intervals hers had been in a sense a missionary life in that she had been for years spreading the news and yet she realized now as never before that she had confined her thoughts and her aims almost entirely to the home work so had her mother before her why did mother do it she asked herself with glowing cheeks as the talk went on for those ladies strange to say were ready to read their papers and outline their maps and give their incidents and talk glibly and well of the work in africa though they could not pray all this seemed strange to mrs spafford to her prayer was the first letter in the alphabet of missions and these ladies almost seemed to have skipped it and reached the middle not that they do not pray of course she said horrified at her own conclusion but then it seems so strange that they know so much about it all and can talk together so well and cannot talk with him then she tried to find explanation for her mother's course surely she had been interested in foreign mission work for what portion of the lord's vineyard was there with which the dear mother's heart had not throbbed in sympathy then she reflected that her mother's life for many years had been that of a secluded invalid that their means had been limited that current literature had been especially in the latter years somewhat scarce she was dependent on me for information as to what the church was doing this daughter told herself reproachfully and how meagre my knowledge was there were no women's boards then oh mother if you had lived how eagerly would you have joined hands with this movement how cruel your daughter was not to keep you in full communication with what the church was doing 
thus far in sad self-reproach and an unutterable longing for the presence of the mother whose heart had responded to every call of the master as fast as she had heard and then did this troubled heart suddenly remember with a glow of comfort that the dear mother was now in the presence of the shepherd and he could tell her all about the field and who shall say that he could not give her willing heart special work to do for him there directly the formal meeting was concluded mrs temple came again to the novice who had so simply and readily taken up her cross she thanked her again with a warmth that embarrassed mrs spafford she introduced her to a host of eager ladies those from whose lips the unfamiliar african names had rolled so readily and the little lady improved the opportunity to ask numberless questions what books or papers did she need in order to post herself about these places where was woman's work to be had what was its expense how should she secure the names and addresses of missionaries was there a missionary library connected with this church or this organization no but upon my word there ought to be said one of the ladies struck with the wisdom of the question that is really an excellent idea we ought to take it into immediate consideration then another oh mrs spafford you must organize your church i have been hoping to hear from that church in your ward this long time i've been trying to get my friend mrs bacon interested she is the only acquaintance i have so far up town i haven't got her started yet but we shall have hopes of her now you will enthuse her and all the rest i don't know said mrs spafford smiling a little though there were tears in her eyes i think i need an infusion of general intelligence i never realized before that i was so utterly ignorant on the subject of missions why i always supposed i was interested i have prayed for missions ever since i was born and really i never knew until to-day that i had almost no actual positive knowledge concerning their present work that lady is thoroughly awake mrs temple said looking after the newcomer with a satisfied bend of her head as mrs spafford having discovered that it was nearly time for warren's car and she should miss that coveted ride up with him unless she hastened took sudden leave not before promising boldly to do her best at effecting an organization in their own church she is wide awake i knew when i talked with her last week that all she needed was a little help to set her into a blaze we shall hear from her you may depend yes madam she is awake what a pity it is that you sweet christian lady as you are could not awaken to the fact that if you were as thoroughly enthused at this moment with the spirit of missions as the young woman you have just helped to waken were as thoroughly consecrated in heart and pure as she is you actually have tenths enough to so swell the coffers of the foreign boards that they could do more in one year than a long life's giving of such tents as she can accomplish that is counting it in dollars and cents thank the dear lord for counting above these thy prayers and thine alms said he to cornelius mrs spafford may give her tiny jewels with joy remembering the wording of that sentence after all it was a so-called chance word which set the pretty blaze of enthusiasm into a white heat as she went down the aisle she came in contact with a small fair girl not more than eighteen with a pretty girlish not to say childish face who grasped her hand with an eager tearful sentence oh dear lady let me take your hand i want to thank you for that prayer i never heard anybody pray so tenderly before for missionaries and their families dear child said mrs spafford stooping to kiss the fair face she looked so small and sweet that the action was involuntary do you love the missionaries so much what has given you such a special interest at your age then the blue eyes filled with tears as the tremulous voice said oh dear madame my eldest brother gave his life for the heathen 
and my elder brother gave his life his wonderful life for them all this was what mrs spafford thought but did not say this was what made the flame of love to which fresh fuel had been added that afternoon burst into a glow the light of which shall burn on and on after mrs spafford's actual earthwork shall be done and she shall have gone home to her mother and her god good work was done for christ that day more than the workers knew away under the waves of a tropical river there lay the bones of one who had given his young life for missions a life nipped in the bud it had been said strangely cut off just after its full consecration and yet that consecrated life spoke to mrs spafford that summer afternoon as nothing else had ever done and i heard a voice saying unto me write blessed are the dead who die in the lord yea saith the spirit they rest from their labors and their works do follow them end of chapter eleven Chapter Twelve of the Pocket Measure by Pansy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve Conflicting Duties. Have you ever observed what a difference a night's sleep is apt to make in one's feelings and plans? Things which appear entirely reasonable in the darkness and loneliness of one's room by night are liable to take different shape to us by daylight the feeling works both ways often deterring us from that which would be entirely right and wise to do and sometimes holding us back from what would have been foolish in the extreme realizing this do you believe that young coleman finished the letter by daylight which he commenced at night and sent it on the same errand that he had planned i think you understand his character well enough to know that by morning the entire idea had taken an absurd aspect to him he paused in the act of dressing and read the lines already written and laughed miss jenny would think i had made a violent exertion to be attentive i fear if she had received that i wonder what she would say to that dried-up prayer meeting anyway what possesses me to go so steadily i believe i had some notion last night of going into the thing a little deeper even but i have returned to sober common sense this morning i don't believe it will pay to let mrs callie exercise such a surprising power over me she thinks i am a hypocrite for going to meeting well perhaps i am just as well to gratify her and stay away occasionally anyway instead of being so alarmingly unlike the rest of the sheep by my regularity pity to spoil that sheet of note-paper miss jenny likes very delicate note-paper i've always observed that she buys the finest let me see how could i finish that in a reasonable manner he sat down to this problem and studied over it a few minutes until apparently it was settled in a satisfactory manner for he dashed off a few lines enclosed the whole in an envelope and sealed and directed it with a complacent air thus it transpired that miss jenny west who was again with her friend mrs evans having come up to spend several weeks while her mother made a long promised visit elsewhere came down to the dining-room where the poor troubled housekeeper was at work trying to decide whether the remains of yesterday's roast could be made to piece out to-day's dinner holding in her hand an open letter and appealed for sympathy delight in her voice look here eva i'm invited to the opera at bellevue hall to-night isn't that lovely very said the weary housekeeper turning from her bone which had an alarmingly small portion of meat left on it and trying to smile who has invited you oh will coleman of course he is the only one of my friends who penetrates to this hiding-place so far uptown it is real splendid of him i must say for the tickets for this opera are awfully expensive and i don't believe will indulges in that way very often i haven't seen him out at any of the summer concerts even i should like so much to go the young wife said 
a common sense of the deliciousness of the music stealing over her the opera had been an attraction for her of which jenny west knew almost nothing in that she tingled to her fingers ends with music and memories of enchanting sounds heard in bellevue hall in the days gone by thrilled her at that moment like an electric shock with jenny it was a nice place to go to show one's new hat and gloves and see the styles and have a charming ride with one's companion and a delightful little series of chats between the scenes and enjoy oneself generally the music was really the smallest part of the attraction nevertheless she was prepared to sympathize with mrs evans you poor child what blue beards husbands are i declare if i were you i wouldn't stand it you don't go anywhere i don't believe you have been downtown to an evening entertainment since you moved up here out of the world i really believe dane treats you shabbily if i were you i would insist on being taken to-night it is a rare opportunity we don't often have such an entertainment as this will be especially in the summer mrs evans was painfully given to being led by the voice that last sounded in her ears and jenny west had at all times a stronger influence with her than she ought to have had but there were some things that could bring the indignant blood to her forehead and the ring of decision to her voice timid woman though she was too much given to meek acquiescence in the opinions advanced at the moment it was not wise for any one to criticize her husband in her presence yet this was one of the most ordinary rules of etiquette which jenny west was every day violating rarely so glaringly however as at this moment dane is not a tyrant jenny nor am i a slave as you seem to imagine we do not go to evening entertainments very often it is true but it is because neither of us wishes to go and i don't allow even a cousin to speak to me of my husband in a way that i consider insulting she was really astonished at the coldness of her own voice so was jenny astonished and a trifle alarmed she did not wish to offend her cousin eva her house was too convenient and pleasant a place especially since she had moved up town mercy she said with an attempt at gaiety how you do snap one up marriage isn't improving to one's tempers you used to be as mild as a june morning eva and now i declare you are enough to frighten one i didn't mean anything either i'm sure you and dane may devote yourselves to each other every evening for the rest of your lives for all objection i shall make i'm glad you enjoy it though i am sure i never should come upstairs do and advise me what to wear i wish i had a new opera cloak mine is really getting shabby though to be sure at this season of the year cloaks don't so much matter it is almost a wonder will would go to-night he is so regular at prayer meeting i didn't know but there was some whim or promise to his mother or something of that sort which kept him so constant in attendance why surely said mrs evans it is prayer meeting evening and you and i were going i know it we shall have to wait until next week i suppose the plan of going together to the prayer meeting that evening had been proposed by jenny herself and eagerly agreed to by mrs evans who remembered that it was her husband's evening to be late also as the trials and burdens of home life pressed thick around her she looked about at times almost wildly for some sort of refuge constantly her mind reverted to mrs spafford and the calm which rested on her fair face whenever the storm-tossed housekeeper met her and as often as this occurred she went back to the bits of conversation which she had had with her and remembered that bright and natural as her manner had been her words turned steadily toward christ as the centre of all her plans whether of housekeeping or benevolence the aim in life seemed to be the same whether the topics were grave or petty thinking of it all it was impossible not to be forced at times to the conclusion that mrs spafford had something connected with her religion of which she mrs evans knew nothing 
what if she could find it and show it to dane and it would unravel the snarl into which life was growing for them for hide it as she would from jenny west and from every other outside eye the daily puzzle was every hour growing more intricate and the gloom was gathering heavier on dane's forehead there were times when mrs evans's heart was well-nigh bursting with its disappointed hopes its loneliness and its foreboding she had no wish to attend an opera it had been a momentary whim which passed as soon as it was mentioned she wanted the tangles of her life smoothed out she wanted to make a happy peaceful home for dane she bitterly felt that she did not know how to do it but she went upstairs with jenny leaving the roast to plan for itself and appeared to interest herself in blue silk and white lace and natural flowers and fresh kids and really went off into a reverie that had to do with herself and dane only rousing suddenly to the sound of jenny's voice as she said i suppose callie spafford would think i was perfectly awful to do it but then if one tried to follow callie's rule of life one might as well turn catholic and go into a convent and be done with it to do what jenny what does mrs spafford think the sound of that name always had a tendency to rouse mrs evans oh she thinks everything is wrong and everybody on earth is awry save her own sweet self was jenny's testy answer as she twitched at the somewhat crushed artificial flowers in her hand and tried to make them look natural and fresh she is the last person i should think of calling an egotist said mrs evans well she is self-righteous and narrow eva just as narrow as a knife-blade she used to be so at school the girls were always making fun of her notions but she grows worse and worse i don't see why either warren spafford wasn't so much more particular than the rest of the world before he became acquainted with her so it isn't his influence but what do you mean she would object to just now why she objects to everything whatever she doesn't do is wicked and she doesn't go to the opera so of course that is wicked wicked to go to the opera there was amazement in mrs evans's tones she had actually never come in contact with a class of christians who held those views but what is there wrong about going to a good opera oh goodness knows i don't if you expect me to give reasons for all that callie spafford thinks is wicked it will keep me busy everything is wicked i tell you but singing psalms and going to prayer meeting and eating just enough to keep you from actual starvation and giving away the rest it is bad enough for me to go to the opera at any time but to go on prayer meeting evening actually to beguile will from his regular attendance she will consider the unpardonable sin miss jenny spoke with unusual asperity truth to tell her conscience was somewhat troubled not about the opera especially she was too shallow to have given those matters serious thought but about herself in general or mrs spafford's opinion of her like the rest of the world she respected mrs spafford the pointed questions which that lady had asked her but a few evenings before concerning will coleman had stayed by and troubled her what if she ought to exert a different influence over him she would like she stopped twisting her artificial moss rosebuds for a full minute and gave the matter serious consideration yes she would really like to see him a christian not a pokey one like warren spafford never going to operas or dances or anything but after all a prominent christian one who led in prayer at public meetings and made addresses and was put on committees and consulted and all that sort of thing he was calculated to shine in such a sphere she believed and perhaps she really ought to use her influence in fact she did and meant to hadn't she told him more than once that she wished he was a church member and what had he done but laugh at her and tell her that he was ahead of her church members now the most of them and so he was but then people would persist in not understanding his position 
because he would not join the church she had half a mind to talk to him about it this very evening it would be a real nice opportunity while they were riding downtown together or on their way back certainly a much nicer time for confidential conversation than they could have during the short walk from prayer meeting by the time mrs evans had turned the subject over in her mind and was ready to speak jenny had recovered satisfaction with herself and was complacently managing the moss rosebuds well perhaps jenny one ought not to go to an opera on prayer meeting evening i never thought of it before and i presume i have done it a great many times but when you think of it it does look inconsistent why don't you write will to choose some other evening and go with you to prayer meeting to-night because i don't believe in any such thing that is a la callie spafford again i should expect to accomplish nothing more than to arouse will's prejudices i have seen that sort of thing done a great many times and i hope never to make such a mistake eva do you think these rosebuds a shade too pink to fit my blue silk i do not but why should consistency arouse his prejudice jenny it isn't consistency it is self-righteousness making a parade of one's religion people ought to yield their own wishes for the benefit of others just think how absurd it would look in me to send will coleman word that because it was prayer meeting evening i could not go with him to the opera when he knows as well as i do that there is a prayer meeting every week in the year which i can attend if i want to while an entertainment of this sort is rather a rare thing for me at least you know i don't get to these expensive entertainments very often can't you see what a self-righteous look that would have to a young man especially if he were not a christian himself if i were a married woman i would make it a point of conscience to go wherever and whenever my husband wished me to it is the only way in which i should hope to influence him to my ways of thinking i think you ought to try that with dane if you were ready to go with him to places of amusement quite likely he would be ready to go with you to prayer meeting you should have heard miss jenny's complacent tones she was growing exceedingly well satisfied with herself and had already forgotten that husbands were bluebeards and her cousin a martyr to the stay-at-home propensities of mr evans her listener found it impossible to accept theories so suddenly neither was she ready to refute them a radical defect in mrs evans education had been that she had too few pronounced opinions of any sort her cousin jenny's views looked somewhat plausible but she was not ready to accept them because of the reference to mrs spafford and her opinions mrs evans was growing every day more sure that when there was a difference of opinion between mrs spafford and jenny west the former was almost certain to be in the right so now she determined to reserve her judgment even in regard to the strange announcement that operas might be wrong until she could hear from mrs spafford's own lips why she thought so meantime jenny's words set her off on another train of thought i have never asked dane to go to prayer meeting with me jenny faced around on her in righteous amazement why evangeline evans i should think you would be ashamed to own it and you a member of the church these dozen years well said the wife apologetically you know they never went to prayer meeting from uncle horace's and before that when mamma was sick i got out of the way of going and so since i have known dane intimately i really haven't been in the habit of going myself it is strange i have been thinking a good deal about it lately about my not going i never thought of asking dane perhaps he would go if i asked him i think i shall try it i should think you should said jenny and she dressed for the opera in a still more complacent state of mind feeling sure that she had set poor eva on the right track to do some good to her irreligious husband and more determined than ever to urge will coleman that very evening to unite with the church and take an active part in its public duties it is everything he needs she told herself confidently 
to make him a perfect christian gentleman and then the carriage came and she went away in state end of chapter 12《Indeed, to her short-sighted eyes, nothing seemed easier than to go among Christian women and enlist their cooperation in a missionary society. It is simply because they, like myself, have not had their attention called to it before, she said to her husband, when she was trying to explain the lethargy of the church on the subject. See how I have lived all these years, doing nothing for the cause, and it is not because I was not interested, I was brought up to consider missionaries of better blood than I, but I simply did not realize anything that I could do for them, or rather for an object so far away from home. We are just waking up as a people to understand the power of little gifts. Of course, this church will join hands with the others. Ten cents a month is so small a sum. Why, Warren, even we can give it, and have quite an amount left for other channels and warren had listened and smiled in a covert way believing in his heart that he knew the world better than his wife yet so resolved was he not to dampen her enthusiasm that he resolutely refrained from expressing a doubt but let her go on her way rejoicing she came home from an afternoon's campaign with plumes sadly drooping in a degree she had gauged the spiritual atmosphere about her it would have been impossible to be a regular attendant at the prayer meeting and not do that so she looked for apathy in certain quarters and a reluctant consent in others and expected to meet with many expressed fears that it would be impossible to succeed but she had not looked for actual outspoken opposition and to think of finding it in the very centre of influence she had by no means a high idea of mrs bacon's religious life the difficulty was that she had no conception of any sort of religious life which wasn't to say the very least in favor of missions it was astounding to discover that mrs bacon could not be said to even approve of them my dear mrs spafford she said and to mrs spafford there was always something peculiarly exasperating about this beginning have you ever carefully studied the entire subject and discovered what an immense amount of money has been expended on foreign missions already with what few returns why to me it is actually appalling when i look over our own fair country and see the need for money on every hand the miserable homes and the miserable children and the squalor and filth and wretchedness everywhere about us and then reflect what immense sums we are annually sending abroad to those wretched heathen, I cannot help being indignant. Now I suppose it would be almost impossible to describe to you what a strange, puzzled feeling this gave Mrs. Spafford. It was such a new idea, she did not know in the least how to answer it. The words she spoke were not intended for an answer, they were simply floating through her mind, suggested by, she did not see clearly what, and she thought aloud, He hath made of one blood all the nations of the earth. Oh, well, I suppose so in one sense, and yet I think you clearly recognize a difference between your own household and the beggars on the street? Not in the sense that they all need feeding. Mrs. Spafford was gathering her wits and began to see the strangeness of the talk yes even in that sense you will let the beggars starve and look after your own household if you have not enough for all dear madame no i have no right to do it i must share my children's crusts even with the children of those worse off than they but what has this to do with the subject after all has not the church of christ bread enough for all the family i am not good at talking in metaphor 
was mrs bacon's half smiling answer let us come down to plain prose you want to start a missionary society in our church to help the foreign work and i say frankly i am a very frank woman that i do not believe in the foreign work i think we have heathen enough at home to look after and until they are all civilized we ought to spend our money and our energies at home this time the answer came promptly and the speaker believed that she recognized the prompting voice in her heart but isn't the direction go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature that was given to the early apostles and of course they went into all the world that was then known yes but in the same breath to comfort his children he said lo i am with you alway even unto the end of the world and the disciples to whom he then spoke have been in his visible presence for hundreds of years and the world is not yet ended the comfort lasts yet and so therefore must the commission besides mrs bacon in our own country are there not churches enough and bibles enough and praying men and women enough so that all may know the way if they will the seed is planted there is no doubt but it will grow the question is ought we not to plant it in other lands and give other nations of the same blood an equal chance to choose oh no doubt there are churches and bibles enough the tone in which mrs bacon spoke would have led one ignorant of her position in the church to suppose that she almost sneered at both bibles and churches as if all that poor people wanted was churches and bibles and prayers my dear madam they need shoes and potatoes a great deal more think of the money thrown away on the cannibal africans enough to have fed and clothed and educated all the poor in our own land and with no return at all now indeed was mrs spafford aghast no return why mrs bacon whole villages among those cannibal africans are clothed and in their right minds to-day and hundreds of them have gone to swell the company in heaven which you know is to be made up of every kindred and tribe and tongue and nation oh yes i know a few of them have professed conversion though whether they understood what was meant by the word is rather doubtful i suppose but think of the cost and of what that same amount of money would have been accomplished at home what was the matter with mrs spafford it seemed to her in thinking afterward of this conversation that her thoughts flowed only through bible channels was it possibly another proof of the faithfulness of a god who said open thy mouth wide and i will fill it she did not think of it at the time it simply seemed the most natural thing in the world for her to say just then what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul i did not think that the worth of a soul could be estimated in dollars and cents mrs bacon is not that what christ meant to teach us when he asked that solemn question but mrs bacon was growing irritable she did not like to argue except with a certain class of people when she was irritable she was always more or less rude so now she said with smiling face and stinging voice my dear mrs spafford what a remarkable memory you must have i think during your leisure hours when you were a teacher you must have memorized the entire bible it must be very convenient in conversation when one is at a loss for words to slip in a bible verse but i don't suppose if the entire bible were repeated to me i should change my mind i am very pronounced in my opinions i am entirely absorbed in home missions and i really believe so long as there is anything to do for our own home land that at least people who have little to give should not dribble it up and send it no one knows where on the plea that they are going to reform the world at the commencement of this sentence mrs spafford felt her cheeks growing red and her heart beating fast and knew by these and certain other uncomfortable sensations that she was angry but before its close the angry feelings had subsided into mirth it was such a curious idea to her that mrs bacon believed herself to be entirely absorbed in home missions how was she proving it 
she will be the very person to visit when we are ready for our sewing school and home for orphans and several other enterprises that we ought to start in this ward she said to herself as she arose to go but the time had not yet come for these so aloud she said i am sorry mrs bacon some of the ladies of the twelfth street church suggested you as the person to take hold of an organization such as i am trying to effect i quite looked to you as a leader if mrs spafford had realized it she had left her most powerful arguments for the last and produced them after it was too late for them to tell an instant flush overspread mrs bacon's face and her eyes were ablaze with a look that showed she was vexed at having made admissions that would cripple her perhaps unpleasantly to be a leader of anything was a temptation and to be expected by the twelfth street church people to lead was a matter of great importance to mrs bacon still what could she do now but abide by her strong words when everything is done at home that ought to be perhaps i may assume foreign responsibilities she said with an attempt at a smile after the thrust she had received it is perhaps strange that mrs spafford should have quoted another bible verse but she felt that she could hardly have kept her lips from saying these ought ye to have done and not to have left the other undone it may have been those very words that tempted mrs bacon to say with her most compassionate smile as she arose to follow her caller to the door my dear mrs spafford you ought to go more into society and then your time would be too much taken up to leave room for any of these restless movements i know how it is young housekeepers who are commencing life in a modest quiet way never have much to do and you have been accustomed to such an active life no wonder you reach out after something to take your time but there are pleasant people all about you i presume you can make a congenial little circle right among yourselves and have very pleasant times after that perhaps mrs spafford would have been almost more than human if she had not gone home with burning cheeks and angry eyes the truth is this dear christian woman was very human indeed she got the better of the anger after a little but the sad-heartedness remained such people as mrs bacon have their influence in the course of a few days mrs spafford was astonished to find out how far her influence extended nearly all the ladies of the church were more or less affected by the fact that the leading one in their midst so far as wealth and position were concerned had refused to countenance the new movement it is true they were variously affected some declared that it was just what they would expect of her that she was a selfish narrow-minded woman and gave less in proportion to her wealth than any other member of their church at the same time these outspoken persons were by no means willing to set mrs bacon a better example by taking the lead in an enterprise which she chose to ignore others said that mrs bacon kept herself well posted and if she did not think an organization of that sort would succeed it was not worth while to undertake it others still declared themselves in sympathy with mrs bacon in believing that there was work enough to do at home in short after a vigorous canvass of the material within her reach mrs spafford wearily admitted to her husband that she had found almost no helpers some are willing but timid and some are bold but opposed she said half laughing and yet feeling tired and discouraged enough to cry i don't believe it is my forte to work up such an organization i have done my best and failed at every point i don't think i understand women i find that they surprise me so you understood girls uncommonly well and they are the material of which women are made replied her husband with the air of a man who stood ready to do valiant battle with any one who dared dispute his wife's ability to understand anything and accomplish the impossible she gave heed only to the first part of his sentence you understood girls uncommonly well this was true as a teacher she had been skilled in the art of leading and guiding the bright pretty wilful girls committed to her care 
she had oftentimes succeeded where others failed she knew she had a peculiar sympathy for girlhood which seemed to give her a power over them she was inclined to be half shy of women who were older or even quite as old as herself she had a curious feeling of youth and inexperience when with them but with girls she felt at home that is an idea she said looking brightly at him i might do something with the girls they have young ladies bands over this thought she pondered until at last she resolved to act no more individual calling carrying the downheartedness from one house to be perhaps increased by her reception at another she resolved to make a bold stroke and get the girls together to be sure she knew very few of them never mind when was she ever at a loss what to do with a company of girls so on the following sabbath bright-eyed girls gave curious inquiring glances from one to another wondering by whose planning they were summoned to meet at number two hundred seven chestnut avenue on saturday afternoon at three o'clock to consult together concerning a matter of importance there was an eager buzzing of tongues over the event girls do you know who sent the notice isn't it queer angie powers are you sure you didn't have a hand in the matter and you haven't the least idea what is going on how funny two o seven chestnut street that is where that bright-looking mrs spafford lives isn't it do you know her girls i do i met her at the festival she and i cut cake half the afternoon i think she is perfectly lovely if it is anything she is interested in i'm going to take hold of it for i know it will be just splendid isn't it queer that we can't find out the least thing about it i declare it is as good as a surprise party you are going aren't you angie oh yes go of course it would be rude not to mrs spafford is a stranger beside it may be something real splendid i like her face i've never met her but i sit where i can look at her all the time in church and i was wishing only last sunday that i knew her these are only a few of the questions answers and comments that fluttered broadcast wherever the girls gathered in knots during the week as the days passed and it became apparent that none of their number were taken into confidence or knew aught that was to transpire the interest deepened and by ten minutes past three on saturday afternoon mrs spafford's tiny parlor was filled even to overflowing into the dining-room with bright eager expectant faces whatever the girls might decide upon after they heard what was to be said to them they were certainly on the high tide of enthusiasm now end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of the pocket measure by pansy the slibrivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen a problem all the girls in mrs spafford's parlor bestowed puzzled glances on each other and were silent mrs spafford had been talking with them eagerly and rapidly she was full of enthusiasm herself she looked to find a response from at least some of them she had unfolded her plan to organize a young ladies mission band to be connected with other bands in the city to be governed by the rules already adopted by the majority of organizations she had explained the nature and object of the meetings had suggested methods of conducting them plans for interesting others the amount of money that would be expected from each member and the few and simple rules by which they would be governed and then she had asked if they were ready to enter into some such effort modified and enlarged as time passed according to their views of things it was at this point that she was met with profound and puzzled silence evidently the girls were astonished and also a little disappointed they had indulged extravagant fancies in regard to the possible object of this mysterious meeting it was a descent into a prosaic world to have the call mean nothing but a mission band i don't know anything about missions or missionaries ventured at last one of the bolder spirits with an embarrassed little laugh 
neither do i i am sure chimed in another voice which mrs spafford afterward learned was apt to be a leading one thus encouraged each and all began eagerly to disclaim all knowledge of mission fields all acquaintance with missionaries and i had almost said all desire to become educated in these directions oh well said mrs spafford briskly then we are the very people who ought to have a mission band one of its objects is to become acquainted with the field and to have an intelligent knowledge of missionaries shall we not by all means try to supplement our educations which seem so deficient in that direction i say we because i have recently awakened to the fact that i am alarmingly deficient and i want you gay young ladies to rouse me to a pitch of enthusiasm come let us vote to organize forthwith and make a complete success of it and stimulate others still those girls looked at each other and held back they were not touched even with the romance of missions yet it looked like the dullest of all ideas they saw no possibility of getting any fun out of it and what do most girls at a certain age live for but fun i don't know marion wells said slowly it seems to me that our mothers are the proper persons for such work they are interested and they know what to say when they get together and we don't then mrs spafford that is just the point the mothers some of them know what to say and the daughters want to learn so that they will know besides don't you know that it takes girls to push these things i look to you to set the mothers an example doesn't it strike you as a pleasant thing to think of meeting and studying up these matters together each adding a bit to the general interest mrs temple tells me that the young ladies in the twelfth street church enjoy their meetings exceedingly the trouble is said addie stowell speaking evidently for a number of them or at least the trouble with me is that i really haven't any money to give i could go to father and coax him to give me ten cents a month i suppose and he would try to do it but really he has just as much as he can do to get along and i know even ten cents a month would be inconvenient to him sometimes besides i never could see any sense in girls going to their fathers for money to give and then calling it their giving it is my father who does the giving in such cases and why shouldn't he do it in the first place without having to pass it through my hands it always reminds me of mother letting me carry the scissors to auntie when i was a little thing she taking hold of the points i always supposed that i carried them and was highly delighted but i would like to feel that i had gotten beyond that stage mrs spafford turned toward the eager energetic speaker with a gratified face here was her first breath of encouragement here was a girl who thought for herself and had thought out certain problems sufficiently at least to desire to find the answer having broken the ice of reserve there were many voices to sustain her i feel very much so declared one and another and yet another until half the young ladies in the room had assented of course i can go to papa for money exclaimed miss lily archer toying gracefully with her parasol as she spoke but what is the sense papa gives for missions always subscribes largely to the boards and that is just the same as our giving of course so i think there is no use in asking him for more besides what a miserable little drop in the bucket ten cents a month would make that would depend upon how many drops fell into the bucket said addie stowell promptly who always came out on the side that seemed to her at the moment the logical one whether or not it contradicted a previously expressed opinion don't you have a definite amount of your own to spend according to your judgment questioned mrs spafford of the fair lily oh dear no i never could get along with definite amounts i am never definite about anything the way i do when i want a thing i buy it and send the bill to papa and he pays it and that is the end of it and miss lily looked around on the group of girls less fortunately situated 
with a pretty little air of superiority she was glad that her father was a millionaire as for mrs spafford she extended her inquiry and found that in all that company of girls some of whom had fathers quite able to furnish them with small amounts of their own and teach them how to systematically use them only two were being thus educated then of course she gave some moments of thought to that useless wish which has been wished over so many times that it is threadbare if she could only get the ear of the fathers and mothers of the church and beg them to bring the next generation up with a due sense of the importance of individual responsibility and the relative value of money and souls the work of evangelization would be done meantime taking life not as she would have made it if she were a grandmother and these were all her grandchildren brought up by her thus far but as it was being lived before her now in all this flutter of prettiness and silliness what was she going to do with them she confessed to herself that making pretty machines of them to be used in passing ten-cent pieces from their father's pockets to the treasury of the church was as little to her mind as it was to Addie Stowell's. Yet here were the facts. Those who could have asked and secured definite amounts to use as they pleased did not please to assume responsibilities, would much rather live in the careless, irresponsible fashion that they had been educated. Beside, even though they had caught the fancy, they were not sufficiently interested in missions to pledge ten cents a month and conscientiously abide by the pledge they could promise oh yes and so could parrots and she was afraid that there would be almost as much sense of the sacredness of a promise in the one case as in the other another fault growing out of the fact that she was not their grandmother and had not brought them up another point by far the larger majority of these girls could not have commanded definite incomes ever so small their fathers were, some of them, too poor, and in other cases, thought they were too poor to do anything of the sort. Then there were always some without fathers, a few already dependent on their own exertions for support, and most of them had so many wants, real or fancied, that given a certain sum of money to spend as they pleased, mrs spafford was almost sure that they would please to spend none of it on such an unknown cause as foreign missions i don't believe in foreign missions anyhow murmured lena bacon and though the others hushed her warningly and shook their heads towards mrs spafford and were too carefully educated in etiquette to believe it proper to express their views on this point in such a presence yet they were by no means too well educated not to agree with lena if anything was done with these girls it must be foundation work first principles that should have been learned at their mother's knees murmured mrs spafford and then she showed what manner of spirit she was of by saying also to herself courageously very well callie spafford they will never learn them earlier now see if you can teach them how to begin that was the question it was not a new question to mrs spafford she had thought of it many times during the past week and was in part prepared it is very evident she said in a clear business-like tone that the first thing we need to do is to make some money now she had the attention of every girl a scheme for making money they were always ready to hear about nay they were ready with suggestions we might have a festival or fair or something of that kind immediately and with eagerness said one of their number whereupon equally eager voices joined in and affirmed what they thought to meet and make fancy articles and have a fair would be just lovely mrs spafford was in no sense dismayed she had not lived through twenty-five years of life and managed many girls without having heard frequently of fairs and festivals and old folks suppers and young folks concerts and character parties and tableaus and mum socials and socials that were not mum and oyster suppers and strawberry and ice cream festivals 
and any and every other imaginable device for obtaining money for the cause she knew this disease in all of its phases had special possession of the girls and must reach its crisis one thing was certain if out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh the hearts of these young misses were very much set on matters of this kind for they immediately became voluble and mrs spafford had to rouse herself from her study of human nature and plunge into the thick of it for fear they would have a tableau party organized before her eyes why do you suppose we always think of devices of this kind whenever we talk about money for the cause of christ it was a general question but after a little astonished pause addie stowell answered why because we girls have no other ways of raising money when we want to give anything and don't want to coax our fathers to do it and let us call it ours we're just obliged to make fancy work and have fairs and oblige people to buy what else is there to do why mrs spafford do you object to such methods of raising money let us see if we do miss stowell didn't i hear you say you could not command money of your own suppose you could use some to good purpose if you had it i'd like to have the chance once said addie with prompt emphasis and the girls laughed very well now i propose that you make a number of fancy articles tidies pincushions and the like and some cake and perhaps coffee and have a fair in the course of a few weeks at your house and announce it in church for the benefit of miss addie stowell and on the evening in question let all these young ladies flutter around and beseech people to buy your tidies and cushions and cake be sure a good price is set on them perhaps just twice what they are worth will not be too much considering the object and let an almost persecution be kept up during the evening by yourself and friends for the sake of the cause how would that impress you mrs spafford said addie with glowing cheeks and eyes that did not seem to know whether to sparkle with indignation or dilate with amazement why mrs spafford chorused a dozen other voices and laughter and exclamations of astonishment and dismay were the order of the next few minutes meantime mrs spafford asked calmly have i caricatured church fairs in the least young ladies isn't it a true picture but mrs spafford that would be a personal matter so different from a church why it would be a perfect insult my dear girls and the gravity of their hostess's voice quieted all the company shall we be more regardful of our own personal reputations than we are of the cause of christ utter silence for a moment and then marion wells came to the front but mrs spafford of course we know that church fairs and all such things are managed disgracefully generally but suppose we had one that was managed right say we worked hard and got a great many pretty things ready and just set a proper price on them such as everybody would own was what they were worth and then had our entertainment without tormenting people just letting them buy what they pleased and kept out all objectionable things there couldn't possibly be any harm in that mrs spafford hesitated not because she had not to say but because she was not certain of her material could she take real high ground with them come out from among them and be ye separate would they understand that be not conformed to this world would they understand that if meat maketh my brother to offend i will eat no meat while the world stands would they understand that studying their faces bright pretty faces though they were she much feared that it would be like speaking in an unknown tongue well she said thoughtfully i presume i shall differ with some of you but do you know i have a tendency toward being independent like miss stowell wasn't it you my dear who never liked to ask your father for money to give and then pretend you had given it yourself i agree with you i don't like to work hard on a yellow dog we will say curled up on a piece of canvas filled in with black or blue or something 
and then have mrs jones say to her husband at the tea-table my dear you must give me some money to-night i suppose i have got to go to that fair the girls are urging me every time they see me i shall have to buy something of course i think i shall get that yellow dog that one of them has been at work at so long they will have a horrid price on it of course and i shouldn't think of affording it for a moment if it were not for the cause of course we must help the mission work along so mrs smith comes to the fair and buys my yellow dog and shows it to her friends and says it is not very well done and was a ruinous price and she doesn't really care for it but of course she had to buy something and so for the sake of the cause she took it now whose money is that which the yellow dog earns if mrs smith speaks literal truth hers or mine it was impossible not to laugh and many of the girls being quick-witted saw the point and admitted that they had often been cross for days over the remarks that they had heard about work being bought not because it was admired or desired but for the sake of benevolence when in fact there was no benevolence about it declared addie stowell stoutly mrs parsons is forever talking in just that way always buying things at fairs and festivals out of pure benevolence it is no such thing she always haggles and minces until she gets the worth of her money and more too and buys just exactly what she wants and calls it charity i don't believe in such people i don't believe in educating people in that way said mrs spafford promptly taking advantage of addie's illustration haven't you often seen gentlemen eat fifty cents worth of oysters and cake and cream and fruit and celery and i don't know what else and pay twenty-five cents for it all and think they were being benevolent hundreds of times said addie but now look here mrs spafford what can be done about it there is no other way that i know of for us girls to earn money i wish there was i hate the whole thing myself i never went to a performance of the kind in my life that there wasn't a fuss of some sort before it was all over somebody's feelings are always being hurt somebody takes too much on herself or somebody doesn't do anything but mince around and give directions oh my i know all about it but i don't see any way out end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen measuring character what would you say to our going into business it was mrs spafford who asked the question with as composed an air as though she was saying the most commonplace thing imaginable no wonder the girls stared going into business repeated addie stowell at last why mrs spafford what can you mean i believe it is feasible their hostess said thoughtfully i think it probable that each of us can do some special thing very well by which we could earn money what is there to hinder our uniting our forces and earning it how is it miss addie can't you at this moment think of a branch of industry which could be made a fair exchange for dollars and cents why yes said addie hesitating a moment then smiling i know how to crochet almost anything if people were willing to buy it after it is done very well suppose now for the curiosity of the thing we learn if there is not a branch of work for each of us i for instance can do plain sewing perhaps a little that is not so very plain if i choose who embroiders and who braids and who hemstitches the subject proved to be one which unsealed all lips and the girls found greatly to their amusement that not one present but asserted her individuality by promptly selecting something from the great field of fancy work that she liked to do in fact would rather do a little of than not but then declared addie i don't know what good it will do us who wants to buy such things they only do it for the sake of benevolence 
and we have to coax and coax until i'm just ashamed besides mrs spafford i thought you didn't believe in it at all what in going into business oh yes i do i am a firm believer in money-making legitimate business of any sort i have a great respect for i don't propose a fair you understand with an evening of eager exciting work with spirits wrought up to fever heat to be followed by days and sometimes weeks of reaction when all the ordinary work of life becomes vapid this that i propose is an entirely different matter still the girls looked from one to another and then back to her and were evidently greatly bewildered it is a conundrum laughed addie at last and i don't believe we can any of us guess it if we all give it up will you tell us the answer it is just as simple declared their hostess smiling as that two and two make four i am proposing a partnership business based from the very first on strictly business rules and regulations without an atom of benevolence about it why isn't it an entirely reasonable thing suppose for illustration that we had a room in the central part of the town suited to our needs and there we opened a well until we find a better name we will call it a fancy store though i do hope we should develop a taste for strictly useful articles as well as fancy ones now what if each of us was willing to advance not contribute you understand but advance fifty cents each as a capital with this capital we purchase each some material and manufacture one two or three articles for sale when all is ready we open our store say for two hours on saturday afternoons one of our number serving as clerk for the first saturday another taking her place on the saturday following we meantime promising that the store shall be kept supplied with the article or articles which we have promised to make provided its returns justify the purchasing of more material we ask no one to buy for the sake of benevolence we put no extravagant prices on anything in the name of benevolence we conduct our business in all respects as our fathers and brothers do dividing the income each month amongst the stockholders and pledging ourselves to use one-tenth of it in benevolence if it shall amount to ten cents a month for each of us our way will be clear to organize a young ladies band then what a tumult there was in that little parlor they all talked at once and laughed and exclaimed and stormed the inventor of this strange scheme with questions she had need of all her wits but mrs spafford how could we plan so as to supply the demand suppose we had but one pincushion for instance and every mortal woman who appeared on some saturday afternoon should insist on having a pincushion women are just so perverse then we would have our secretary notify the members that all the pincushion force were desired to put their brains and fingers to work and make pincushions in view of the next saturday's onset where would we get our material we would need a buying committee or rather a buying partner that is quite common in all large firms some one or two whose duty it would be to purchase material write orders to be sent in as to what was needed and the money for the purchases calculated beforehand and drawn from the funds held by paying clerk suppose she hadn't money enough for the purchases then we should manifestly have to do without the material until such time as we could afford to enlarge our business couldn't we buy on credit both mrs spafford and addie stowell shook their heads emphatically at this and addie said no ma'am you don't catch me launching out in any enterprise that hasn't a solid cash foundation i should expect my father to disown me forthwith if there is anything he hates it is the credit system what if we become bankrupt there is no danger of it mrs spafford answered promptly a business done on cash principles has no occasion for bankruptcy well said marion wells when the babble of tongues was somewhat subsiding it is a novel idea certainly and it is a great deal more fun than a fair 
but after all i can't see what special difference there is in the right or wrong of the matter i think fares are all right but if i didn't i fail to see why i shouldn't condemn this also why you don't think stores are wrong do you this question in various forms was levelled at her by several of the girls at once mrs spafford sitting back a silent listener and enjoying this sharpening of their wits oh well marion said of course it was nice to use such phrases but also of course it wouldn't be a real store nor conducted on any such principles it would just be a fair or bazaar or something of that kind with a different name this made mrs spafford sit erect and speak decidedly not if you follow out my plan girls i warn you beforehand that i mean nothing but business i think very likely that real fun as you call it can be gotten out of the idea but it is not to have that for a foundation i have been proposing a strictly business transaction and if you vote to adopt my suggestion it must be with the understanding that every member of the firm is held rigidly to business rules and regulations from the very outset in fact i hope one outcome from the enterprise if you take it up will be a discovery if any of you need to make a discovery that young ladies can be as thoroughly businesslike and methodical in their work as men we expect to do what is strictly woman's work it is true and to do it in womanly ways but those ways should never for a moment be allowed to become a synonym for looseness or inaccuracies now as to the question concerning the essential difference between such an enterprise and what is known as a church fair one of my objections to the latter way of working is the fact that there is no legitimate place for any such work the church even its chapel or parlor or lecture room by whatever name you call its smaller rooms is not and according to my idea should never become a place of merchandise buying and selling may be very legitimate transactions but we don't want to see them carried on in a church even when we hire a hall for the purpose it is not actually suited for such a purpose and the large amount that is likely to be charged for it detracts so much from the possible profits that it of itself begets in us a feverish desire to make up that leak by enormous profits or questionable side traps like post offices and lemonade wells even if we do not descend to the actual coarseness of ring cakes or grab bags this plain speaking produced a sensation the girls bestowed speaking glances on each other convenient elbows were nudged and one or two quite loud ahems indicated that some portion of the audience considered another portion of it touched on sensitive points none of these little asides did mrs spafford pause to notice but hastened to add then another and very important drawback is the fact that preparing for a fair always brings a period of feverish haste and excitement the eventful evening about which so much talk has been made and of which so much is expected is chosen and announced and draws near and the gay young workers wake up at the eleventh hour to discover that they are not nearly ready for it then come late hours and neglect of books and study and duty of almost every sort and the girls run hither and thither distractedly unable to think of anything but the approaching crisis finally it comes and the last day before the final crush is often filled up with heart-burnings caused by mistakes made or quick words spoken under the impulse of haste and strong excitement haven't you admitted here this afternoon that such is nearly always the case besides i wonder if any of you can have forgotten the distressing reaction of the next morning when only a very few of you rise to the degree of self-abnegation necessary to helping royally in the clearing up the rest stay at home and are miserable because their consciences hint that they ought to be helping and those doing the work are miserable because they are tempted to say sharp uncharitable things about the people who are not helping and for days thereafter there seems to be very little in life worth doing while at the same time 
nothing looks so improbable as that they will ever want to go through the trials of another fair now all this is unnatural and unhealthy in business life it is very different there is a regular routine which never or at least need never rise to an absorbing height to be followed by days of reaction besides there is no temptation to lose all delicacy of feeling and sense of propriety and make oneself a nuisance by tormenting people to buy what they do not want because it is for the church as if the church were a beggar and must be supported by public charity mrs spafford's cheeks glowed she was very sensitive where the honor of the church was concerned as she looked at the matter it had been made by those who should have guarded its reputation carefully to wear the guise of a pauper long enough some of the girls laughed they thought their leader peculiar they were incapable of taking such high ground why should they not be their mothers before them had not taken it had not so educated them but there were two or three whose thoughtful faces and earnest eyes helped mrs spafford wonderfully she could plainly see there was material here for growth if only two or three and those leaders could be educated even at this late day to take such a stand as she was sure ought to be taken on all these questions the generation to come would see a reform but whether most of the girls saw the principle at stake or not they saw the novelty and were interested and excited over the scheme to go into business to make money to be partners and have a buying committee and a money drawer and a scheme unlike anything else that had ever been tried was something that they could understand and appreciate with but one exception they voted unanimously in favor of the scheme miss lily archer was sure it would not meet with mamma's approval mamma has peculiar ideas she said looking down with sweet shyness and toying with her fan i beg your pardon for saying so but i am sure she will think it unladylike poor little lily archer mrs spafford had herself seen her personating rebecca at the well dressed in a startlingly picturesque costume dipping up lemonade for certain fast young men who laughed and talked too freely with the jewish maiden to represent either ancient history or modern propriety according to the views of some but the fair lily as unlike the jewish type of features and color by the way as her mimic lemonade well was unlike the spot where rebecca watered the sheep had never been taught that style of propriety also she had seen her in a tableau personating a richly dressed and richly jeweled dishonorable wife receiving a tender caress from a man who was not even in the tableau her husband and neither she nor her mother had considered this unladylike what could be expected from such nevertheless miss lily did not positively withdraw she said she would think about it would talk with mamma it was all so very new and queer nothing like it had ever been done in our set you know oh she would help make pretty things and buy them very likely and of course she would give the fifty cents why did they have such a ridiculously small sum to start with oh as to giving and all that sort of thing of course she would help but she couldn't put her name down as one committed to sustain the enterprise at least not now and just here mrs spafford interposed no they would not take her money if she were not ready to join heart and hand in the work they would have none of her it was right that she should consult her mother of course they were all to do that nothing was to be definite this afternoon except plans to be submitted to the heads at home the only question to be settled was do you agree heartily uncompromisingly to all this if mother and father do still miss lily's name would not go down and mrs spafford had discovered what she surmised and wanted to know that mamma was put in as a graceful way of saying that the idea looked dull and commonplace and lacking in gentility to the fair lily occasionally there is a curious offshoot from the parent tree 
as unlike what might be expected as possible just such an unexpected character did lena bacon suddenly develop she shook back her gay brown curls and flashed her bright eyes and declared that she thought it was just fun ten times nicer than any fair she had ever heard of and she was going into it with all her heart and could paint christmas cards in a perfectly lovely way everybody knew and they'd see what she could do what shall we do for a store queried one and the question brought a sudden lull and all eyes looked inquiringly at mrs spafford as though she were then and there expected to produce a store ready for occupancy we need a room in somebody's house she said promptly a good-sized convenient room that some person who has more house room than she needs will rent to us on reasonable terms oh yes indeed we must pay rent this is not benevolence remember it is business who of us wishes to beg a house to live in rent free where shall we find the person to appeal to who has unnecessary house room immediately all eyes were levelled at addie stowell she lived with her father mother and young brother in the old family mansion which had been almost in the country in the days long ago before the city moved up so far the family had been old aristocratic and wealthy the wealth had departed but age and aristocracy were left still it was no sham aristocracy the family had no more idea of trying to profess themselves rich now that they were poor than they had thought of professing poverty in the days of their wealth but a store in the old stowell homestead that was a leap somewhere surely and yet the house was so large and so roomy and so quaint and so exactly what would delight every girl among them addie laughed you all look at me as though i owned a first-class store in my own right she said gaily i know what you are every one thinking of you see yourselves at this minute selling tape and thread and pins in our big old shut-up parlor ought we not to have a thread and needle and so forth department mrs spafford it is a perfect nuisance to have to take a car down town for everything of that sort that is wanted i know plenty of people who think so well i'll ask mother and father that's the best i can do we have thought of most everything to help along but we never thought of renting the parlor for a store before now that's the truth but why not mother'll be willing i think i don't know about father why lafayette was entertained in that house you know and general washington himself it ought to be dedicated to liberty and the pursuit of happiness then oughtn't it sure enough well i'll see what i can do end of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the pocket measure by pansy this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen last night measured by daylight it was all fairyland to jenny west the evening was so lovely the carriage so luxurious the accessories all so perfect she was conscious of looking remarkably well and will was so handsome then too as they rolled smoothly down beckman avenue some of the very girls that she would have preferred above all others to have seen her under those circumstances walked slowly by casting admiring not to say envious glances at the occupants of the carriage will was in a specially genial mood for he was a young man given to fluctuations in his moods even when with jenny west sometimes he was so nearly silent as to be almost moody and his heart would be evidently busy with perplexing thoughts but on this evening he chatted gaily yet with a gentleness in the gaiety and a careful attention to his companion's comfort such as made her heart throb with gratified something who shall say whether it was love or pride the subjects for conversation were numerous and sufficiently interesting so that jenny while she thought of that important matter about which you will remember she intended to talk with him that very evening she told herself it wasn't a suitable opportunity just now she would wait a little 
and as they neared the whirl of the city she said still to her inner self when we are coming home will be just the time for a grave subject like that there are too many people looking at us now and it is too light and bustling it is almost like being in society when it is dark and quiet all around will be a much more suitable time for earnest talk will is so full of life now i presume he will have calmed down by that time so she dismissed the prayer meeting as a topic for conversation and gave herself up to pleasure as for the opera it was all that operas generally are and perhaps more than some the simple truth is that this young lady and gentleman in purity of sentiment were above the play to which they were listening the style of dressing presented was such as covered jenny's face with blushes and made her attendant wish several times that he had not been such a fool as to bring her the main reason that either of them endured in quiet that which offended their sense of propriety was because the house was well filled with fashionable people whose position in society jenny at least thought was such as to warrant one in being pleased with whatever pleased them so though she blushed she also laughed moreover there was of course a great deal to enjoy the carefully studied scenery the witching music the exquisite play of light and shade the exquisite toilets all combined to fascinate a wiser head than jenny at her best possessed the fact that a great deal of the singing was in an unknown tongue was a greater source for thankfulness than at least these two realized however much she might have desired to admire because it was a fashionable opera and the fashionable world admired it i feel sure that could poor jenny have understood the meaning of some of those sentences she would have blushed not only but would have withdrawn herself from that indecent presence whatever may have been said of the larger portion of the audience i am glad to be able to tell you that will and jenny could not translate and never had heard translated much that they listened to that evening this being the case what was there about it all that seemed such an intoxication is there something peculiarly sensuous in music jenny found herself yielding more and more to the spell which she did not understand had she been familiar with the lotus eaters she might have quoted from their story to describe her sensations life real actual daylight life seemed horrible to her something to shrink from dread to sit forever surrounded by all the soft and tender and exquisite sights and sounds the dreamy lull of music floating around her will coleman slowly swaying her elegant fan to and fro in exquisite time with the music this was life happiness heaven nothing else was worth a thought did she put all this nonsense into words not at all she was not even conscious save in a dim way that she thought it she did not know that her mental faculties were actually intoxicated well it ended at last as even such hours of bliss will end and they passed out into the darkness only for a moment they made their speedy way to a refreshment room and jenny daintily tasted an ice while will drank before her eyes a glass of wine it was something that he rarely did before her something that he knew she in a sort of fashion disapproved yet to-night he was excited and felt that he needed it to steady his nerves besides was her disapproval so very great she only shook her head at him and said oh will i am ashamed of you but she smiled and looked so pretty while she said it that he felt provoked to tempt her to say it again she is as pretty as a witch to-night he muttered as he drained the last drop i wish i could take her to the theatre or to the opera or somewhere every night of her life and there were no days between to think about i wish i had a fortune hang it all i wonder if i dare take another glass it was more fortunate for jenny than she knew that he decided another glass unsafe his was not the sort of brain that could bear even one glass steadily 
and he hurried her somewhat abruptly away from her ice and into the carriage in a few moments they left the brilliantly lighted streets and were alone and quiet no society now nothing to prevent that earnest talk which jenny was to have had with her friend that evening the soft balmy air hovered around them and the holy stars looked down on them and every influence of nature was calming and ennobling what was the trouble with jenny every nerve was in an intense and unnatural quiver she had by no means calmed into her ordinary self life was an intoxication still not a grave day-by-day -day reality she didn't think of the days at all only the witching star-lighted nights and soft cushions and careful hands to draw her wrappings about her she hummed a bar from the most dreamy strain that the opera contained and said wasn't it perfectly lovely will did you like it he asked her and he looked down on her and she looked beautiful to him neither did his voice have its usual poise he had the added excitement of a glass of wine to combat like it she said ecstatically it was heaven the comparison did not jar her neither was it said with the intention of being irreverent her senses were aglow do you think during that four miles drive she said anything to him about the prayer meeting or about joining the church and leading in prayer and taking his position as a responsible and prominent member the church she forgot its existence what had the church in common with this entrancing star-lighted night with the weird strains of the opera still sounding in their ears just now would she have cared to hear his voice in prayer what mattered whether he was ever an officer of the church i do not wish you to understand that any of these thoughts presented themselves for her to settle for they were simply so utterly unimportant that she forgot them all jenny her companion said looking down on her as she curled in a graceful little ball among the cushions don't you wish we were a million miles from home and it was going to take us forever to get there ah me as they count distances who understand the relative importance of things how many million miles were those two from home god grant that it may not take them forever to reach there this was a speech that will coleman in his cooler moments would think silly would sneer over it is a pity for a man to make remarks to a woman that even he himself will have to sneer over when he remembers them afterward but jenny was in no mood to help him yes she said with a delicious sense of dreaminess to her voice i wish nothing was anywhere what did that mean not even jenny knew and if she didn't who should the young man kept looking at her he hesitated a little he struggled dimly with his judgment but it was such a witching night and she was so pretty and well he was in no mood to struggle why should he why should anybody do anything save exactly what he wants to do jenny he said and he bent his head lower and drew her wrapping more closely around her and herself more closely to him dear jenny do you think i am going to tell you what was said even over such a miserable little caricature of love as this for the sake of the high and holy feeling which it imitates i would draw the veil of silence you can imagine what was said the impassioned words that were spoken the solemn promises that were made what a solemn pity it is that neither of those young things for so far as regarded their knowledge of life and its responsibilities and solemnities both were young what a pity that they should play with promises so sacred nor realize that the eternal god looking down upon them heard their vows and recorded them for their eyes to meet again after this living is over it was not until hours afterward that jenny all her pretty things thrown wildly around mrs evans's guest chamber as she overturned a pile of laces to find a stray brush was reminded by a glimpse of her bible 
that she had designed this evening's conversation in a different channel i declare she said aloud pausing in her search i never said a single word to will about joining the church or anything i forgot every breath about it oh well how could i be expected to know what strange things he would have to say to me and she blushed and laughed to herself in the light of the tardy moon that was just flooding the eastern sky then the soliloquy went on i shall have opportunity enough hereafter to say what i choose and he will be bound to heed what i say besides i wonder if we shall go to many operas together will said the music was well enough but oh dear what nonsense he talked to-night i wonder if he meant half of it there was a happy light in her eyes she fully believed just then that he meant much more than half of it but it was thus that she dismissed the subject of the church and will's proposed prominent part in it no i mistake it was not dismissed yet her thoughts reverted to it the moment she knelt to pray if ever jenny west was to pray for her friend you would think it might be on the night when she had promised to be his forever but she found i cannot say to her dismay that it was even harder than usual to hold her thoughts they would flutter around that eventful evening and live over again its scenes if her thoughts while she knelt there in the attitude of prayer could have been photographed before her i fancy they might have startled her a little they ran somewhat after this manner our father who art in heaven i really don't know whether i care to have will join the church after all people can be good without that he is real good i am sure if i ever do half as well as he has done i shall be content hallowed be thy name some people have such overstrained ideas about a public profession callie would think he ought never to go inside of an opera after that i wonder what callie will say to the news i have to give her as if there could be any harm in operas i'm sure the music was heavenly and the whole scene the lights and flowers and the colors and everything was unlike earth enough to make one think of heaven thy kingdom come thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven will is such a perfect gentleman it is a pleasure to have him even pick up one's handkerchief he does it so gracefully i wish callie and her husband hadn't so many notions i fairly dread to tell her about it she will have a lecture for us both i don't want to be as good as callie is now that's a fact she is too good for this earth she ought to wait until she goes to heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors if he only had money he would be just perfect what a shame it is that his old aunt didn't leave her property to him i hate the sight of that prinking red-haired niece that got it all she thought she would get will by the means i'll show her that she missed her calculation in that respect lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil will shall take me to the theatre occasionally anyhow i've never been to the plays that i want most to hear for thine is the kingdom do you imagine she realized the two trains of thought which she was carrying on i don't think she did the form of the prayer was so familiar to her that she did not need to hold her thoughts to the words and she was so used to letting them flutter off in that wild fashion on whatever chanced to occur next that she did not feel the startling incongruity at the close of the formula she did draw her thoughts away long enough to put up one sincere if selfish petition oh lord please take care of my dear will i wonder if he has gotten home yet this last sentence not included in the prayer but insisting on presenting itself in the same breath to be thought about as for will coleman he dismissed the carriage at the corner feeling the need of a walk in the cool quiet air to calm his blood after all the excitements of the evening what he thought he kept entirely to himself not even expressing it by a whistle he let himself into his boarding-house in a very quiet fashion quietly made his way upstairs lighted his lamp 
and saw first that bible lying open exactly where he had left it several days before lying on his bookshelf where he had lain it proof positive of the amount of daily care his room received and of the amount of bible reading that he had since done he seized it now closed it roughly without a glance at the fly-leaf and tossed it to the topmost shelf without a word the next morning there was no moonlight no starlight no music only for the young man a sense of exhaustion following the late hours and intense excitement of the night before and the dull headache which always followed a glass of wine hey ho he said with a weary yawn i've got to get through another day at that confounded store selling potatoes and onions and cabbage and cheese i wish the world was made of rose leaves and we dined off nectar and ambrosia eight hundred dollars a year and house rent and cabbage and what not to say nothing of opera tickets and carriage hire and kid gloves six buttons on them too i counted last night i wonder that didn't steady my nerves what a confounded simpleton i was the idea of my acting like a youth with ten thousand a year still i don't know how a fellow was going to help it the music and the witchery generally got hold of me and she is as pretty as a doll if it weren't for money it would be all right some people succeed in making money in this world but they don't do it selling onions and the like for other folks to pocket the profits i believe i must cast about for a better way and jenny well it was morning with her and the flowers she wore the night before had withered and the witching curls of her hair were one irritable snarl also she heard mr and mrs evans in their room talking talking too loud dane was when the guest chamber had an occupant the fact is eva this is what she heard him say the fact is we must retrench in some way or i must just admit that i am a dishonest man and cannot pay my bills i have no sort of idea how i am to meet those already made and they grow larger every day of our lives there is mismanagement somewhere pshaw said the lady in the guest chamber as she jerked out a whole frizz which had tied itself up into a million cross little knots if will ever ventures to speak to me in any such fashion as that he'll be sorry i can assure him bills and retrenchment and embarrassment i wonder if i am doomed to hear that story all my life if i thought i was i'd want to go to the next opera and have a good time and drown myself in the river on the way home will and i isn't it a sad beginning to a union of care and trial and responsibility and pain when the first morning afterward looks just as it did to those two and yet they thought poor things that they loved each other End of chapter 16